Uh, that's fun. This is Brian Rowe from LS NTAP. Thank you guys for all coming out today to the Using Technology to Enhance Legal Services de Delivery Opportunities for Innovation. Um, this is the first time that we've done this particular series, so we will have a survey at the end where we'd appreciate your feedback. Um, the slides are online, and as um, Laura Quinn is doing her introduction, I'll get you guys a link to the slides. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to put those into the chat channel. Um, you may also unmute yourself and ask those questions aloud. Star six will mute or unmute also. Uh, thank you guys so much for coming out to this. We've got about uh, 10 more webinars coming up throughout the rest of the year, and those are all listed on the lsmtap.org website. Thank you, Laura. Very excited about this. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Hi, guys. Uh, this is Laura Quinn. Um, I think many of you have met me or heard me speak before. I am the now the Director of Partnerships and Knowledge at Idealware. Um, Idealware, just quickly, for those of you who may not know us, we are a nonprofit ourselves who does research to help other nonprofits make smart technology decisions. Um, and we have been working with the legal aid community for years now, three or four years, um, to, um, uh, in a lot of different ways, help folks in that community, in your community, um, make your own smart software decisions. So we're talking today about opportunities for innovation. And when we say innovation, we don't really mean what one might initially think. We don't necessarily mean, you know, rocket ships and, and jetpacks and things like that. We really think of innovation as the ability to use what already exists, so even what you, what you already have in the office, or things that are out in the world, potentially not at vast additional cost, the ability to use those in really uh, innovative ways. So like we're looking at here with a duct tape hammock, um, to the extent that this hammock actually works and it's not going to fall apart as soon as you fit in it, um, it is kind of an innovative way to fill the need of wanting to, you know, hang out in your backyard. Uh, probably at less cost than actually buying a hammock. Um, so that's kind of what we're, we're talking about today is the idea of not necessarily what's super bleeding edge. So it's things that are uh, kind of interesting to think about, both things that are going on in the, non in the legal aid space and things that are going on in a wider nonprofit context. And it's, you can get yourself in this mode by kind of thinking back to when you were a kid. Uh, kids are natural innovators. They do all sorts of, like, they give them something, and they'll do all sorts of crazy things with them. You give them a box, and it becomes anything. It becomes a Ford. It becomes a robot. Um, and so basically putting yourself in that mindset can be really helpful. We generally, as professionals, don't as easily come up with lots and lots of creative ideas like this. And we need to spark our own innovative tendencies more. So we need to actually say, what is it that we need? Uh, what are our organizational needs? And then what technologies are there in the world? And let's actually spark them. Let's attempt to connect them. Um, so to uh, kind of say, what is it that I can do, like, for instance, attending this seminar or a conference or reading stuff, to connect those thoughts together? Let me actually pause there and uh, let, I realize we didn't let our, um, our expert guest speaker introduce herself. Um, so, uh, Kathleen, can you just take a moment to introduce yourself and maybe give just a thought or two of what innovation means in your mind? I am the uh, administrator of the Pine Tree Legal Assistance websites in Maine and some other legal aid websites in Maine. But some of you knew uh, my mentor, Hugh Calkins. And to the extent that um, I have become a more creative web administrator, I think it's because of Hugh. Because when I see the pictures of those kids, 
um, that's what he was like. <laughs> and those of you who knew, <laughs> it was just always about you know the old proverbial thing about playing in the sandbox and jumping off the cliff and jumping in over your head and all those kind of things. And when you're willing to do that, it's amazing uh, what can happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we're going to get to that in just a second. And uh, basically the format for this session is we're going to walk through a lot, like maybe about 30 different tiny mini case studies um, to hopefully spark some thoughts in your own mind as to what you might be able to do in your organization. Before we get there, though, we want to just make sure that you think about not just these nifty ways to use technologies, but just the nuts and bolts. So before you really start to think about innovating, you really need to make sure that you have the essentials in place. So you've got computers, you've got a file server, a backup system, email, calendaring, office software. Uh, case management software. Um, so you don't want to start thinking, you know, really more advanced thoughts about what you can do until you've got those essentials in place. But then when you've got those essentials in place, there's also kind of a middle tier of technologies which are pretty well proven. I'm not sure that people would say that they're innovative. Um, but they're beyond the basics. Um, so things like document assembly. Um, we're currently working on a different project for LSNTAP where we've talked to a number of people about a number of different technologies. And to a person, folks are saying that document assembly is really an enormous bang for the buck. It's an enormous time savings for staff, very much worth the money, and everybody should do it. Um, Kathleen, you wanted to say a, a minute or two about why or, or why not, potentially, people should use document assembly? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, we before we had access to the school, um, we had a lot of court forms, particularly family law court forms, um, you know, programmed as fillable PDFs. And uh, we were pretty happy with that, and we were, I think, at first reluctant to let go of that, although, of course, Hugh wanted to jump in right away. <laughs> <laughs> um, but as time has gone on, and it's still handy sometimes to just be able to do a fillable PDF, but as time went on, we saw more and more um, the advantages of uh, being able to, to do way more complex things with um, document assembly than we were able to do with JavaScript and PDF. For example, most of us have really complicated child support um, calculations. And um, we were able to do that with HotDoc um, much more easily, and we can edit it much more easily than uh, we were with fillable PDF and JavaScript, so we've kind of actually let that version go and gone over just to the hot dog. Great. Um, another one that's in this vein, uh, so kind of not really innovative, but a little bit beyond the basics, is the idea of online intake and maybe some basic triage. We're going to be talking about uh, more of what's going on with more uh, with innovative triage uh, in, in a few minutes, but kind of this whole idea of allowing people to input their information online, describe their legal problem, get connected in the right way, at least to be able to say, all right, you are or are not eligible for help, and here's the next step for you. Kathleen, just you want to talk for a minute yeah. or two about online intake? <laughs> Actually, I told Laura when we were preparing not to let me talk about online triage, because <laughs> that's what I'm in the middle of doing right now, and I'm very jazzed up about it, and I could talk about it for about an hour. Um, <laughs> but as, as some of you know, um, three New England are developing this year um, an online trio system based in Drupal. And uh, a few folks have done this ahead of us at, at Northwest and Massachusetts and a few other places, and we sort of built on what they did. and 
we're really, really excited about um, what we've done with it, and uh, we want to roll it out to anybody else on a Drupal platform with better documentation than we've got right now. We're going to wait till we have the documentation better uh, put together, but before the end of the year for sure. Um, and I know there are a lot of other experiments going on out there and people trying different tools, Neotologic, um, when in uh, Illinois, the first used something called Google. Um, so I think this is a just very exciting area and I'm really pumped up on it right now. And the first Fantastic. month, we got a ton of traffic on our on our triage. Um, so we're really excited about seeing the results and um, how it's working for folks. And I think it is working. Fantastic. And uh, last, we're going to talk more about mobile also, so in more kind of innovative ways to use mobile, but it's a really interesting area here that there's a lot of, there's a lot of straightforward things possible with their mobile that are really work out to, to have really high bang for the buck. Um, but it's also really important to, to think about the wide number of people who are using mobile. So especially among lower income populations, there are in fact, uh, there's a lot of communities in which it is more likely that people have a phone, uh, to at least a text-enabled phone, if not a smartphone. It's more likely they have one of those than they have a computer. Um, so it can be a really important way to reach out to lots of different audiences. Kathleen, just a few thoughts here. Yeah, yeah. On, on uh, the Pine Tree site, which is a very heavily traveled site, um, our mobile use exceeded all of the use, including laptop, desktop, tablet, in I think it was October of 2014. Mobile tipped over the 50% mark. And I'm sure that those of you who follow, follow your analytics have similar experiences. Either you're over 50% at this point or approaching that. And of course, this, the curve is very steep. It's probably old news to a lot of you, but uh, I, I think it's worth repeating over and over until everybody uh, has heard it, that if you're redesigning designing the site or redesigning your site, um, you know, the whole thing now is really to, to design for mobile. And then you build out using responsive theming uh, from there for larger screens. Um, but it's not just anymore, oh, you think about, oh, yeah, and mobile, it's mobile first. And Google has really uh, emphasized this by prioritizing now in search results mobile optimized sites. So it is essential for our clients who are going to use search as the first place to look for us that we be at the top of those search results. Absolutely. Fantastic. So that was a look at some of the kind of just basic infrastructural stuff and then kind of getting beyond the basic to pretty well proven technologies in the legal aid world. Um, but we're actually focused on uh, beyond that. So what's the next step? So assuming that you're doing some good stuff in at least one or two of those kind of beyond the basics area, what can you think about in terms of taking it further? Or, in fact, just adding on to your basic infrastructure with some low-cost ways to potentially really make a big impact. So let's start, we're going to walk through a couple of different areas. Let's start by thinking about the idea of helping clients learn. So letting them self-serve without necessarily you or a lawyer being directly involved in the interaction. So SMS is a really useful thing to think about here. It, it, SMS, so texting on, on phones, almost everybody now has access to SMS, and you can construct uh, very robust branching structures to allow people to get, kind of to walk through answers to simple questions on, via text. So for instance, we've got here an example of um, 
uh, someone getting help in regard to their, their license being suspended. So the text drive um, to this particular, some particular number, and it gives them um, uh, options to say, all right, which of these is true? And they say one, and they ask them some questions. So they can essentially do a bit of triage and referral via, via SMS. Kathleen, what have you seen in the realm of, or Brian, either one, uh, in the realm of this kind of automated SMS type stuff? You know, I think back to, I forget what TIG conference it was, but it was quite a few years ago. Um, I was asked at the last minute to uh, give a, a little session on this. Um, because the person who was supposed to do it couldn't be there. <laughs> and uh, there happened to be some people from Canada at the session, and um, they were the only ones that were really plugged into it. Everybody else looked at me like I was kind of nuts. Uh, but I think that in, in other countries where texting started be in a big way before it started here, in, other, in European countries and in Canada, that a lot of this is automated SMS um, stuff is already happening a lot. Um, and also, mm -hmm. I haven't gotten my executive director on board yet, so I can't speak from my own experience. But also, if you look at this uh, Laura's slide and the organizations that are doing this, to me that says, um, this is where you want to be. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, and in, in good company. Um, just kind of another example in this realm that I think a, a lot of us are familiar with is the idea of doing a mobile app. Um, so as opposed to SMS or opposed to a mobile website, an app is something that you actually download onto your phone. And there's actually, to my mind, somewhat limited reasons why you would use a mobile app as opposed to a mobile website. But here's a good example of, of something that you might do. So this is people who are studying for citizenship. Um, there, among other things in this mobile app is a kind of a, a flashcard test study uh, type thing, which is something that you can totally imagine saying, yes, I'm going to download this onto my phone so I can do it without necessarily when I'm online. So another interesting use here. Yeah, I, um, I just want to say, Marcus Laura, I just want to mention that, uh, you know, apps are, uh, native apps are a big deal, and we've experimented a lot with them, and I think, again, there are certain uses for them that really make sense, but I think before you go there, you really want to think hard about uh, the advantages of a, a um, native app and what your purposes are and who you're trying to reach before um, you go na native app. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And Brian, any thoughts in general about kind of ways that people can provide more innovative ways for clients to, to stay informed via mobile? Well, one of the big things about a mobile app is that you can give them a significant amount of information that they can then download and access in areas where they don't have cell coverage. Um, some programs have looked at doing wage tracking um, apps for their farm worker outreach units so that they can track those hours even though they don't have access and then upload them at a later point in time. It's just taking advantage of the opportunity to provide content when they don't have that broadband connection is one of the big advantages. Yeah, that's a great example. Cool. All right, and so then you have kind of moving over into another way of thinking about uh, helping clients learn is the idea of kind of providing online trainings, uh, including uh, allowing folks to watch videos, take tests. You can uh, online, um, uh, online learning tools are very um, tailorable now, will allow you to do branching logic, take people down different pathways to learn about different types of topics, um, and including you could do potentially an entire online course. Um, so for instance, um, uh, Illinois Online is doing a 
something where they actually uh, allow people to step through a number of modules. So it doesn't have to be just a short, you know, whatever, five or ten minute module, but it could be a series of modules that are taken over time. Uh, or another, a different model on this could be the idea of, uh, of a long distance university type model where people can get, actually get information from a live instructor. Um, so there's lots of, actually me and Brian were just chatting before the call, there's been lots of advancement in kind of online conferencing and online learning uh, tools just in the last couple of years because there's been a bunch of new entrants into the market at the low end, which is both makes a lot of uh, a lot of things more possible and it also uh, are more affordable and it also brings the top end pricing down uh, to compete with it. So there's some interesting stuff there. Kathleen, what do you think about the the idea of providing kind of online modules or online courses? Yeah, well, you know, I think the work that the universities have done have really advanced this and really made um, tools available and the concepts around it just so much more sophisticated by the year. And it's, it's really so viable both inside and outside of legal services now. Um, I just wanted to mention, too, on the Drupal side that Connecticut, the Connecticut folks have built a very nice um, online classroom tool uh, that you can basically use as an architecture and then um, dump your content for your particular course into it. And um, I don't know a lot of the details, but I know Kathy Daniels mentioned to me recently that they're currently um, working to have a cloud-based version of that for uh, folks. And also, of course, the uh, if you want to incorporate the classroom module onto your site, if you're Drupal, you can use that code. We're going to be doing that actually this year for some stateside stuff. Fantastic. And Brian, I know you, you guys obviously do a ton of modules of various sorts, um, online conferences, recorded modules. What have you kind of what have you observed about a kind of as we move to the the future what what is working well and not not as well well I would say one one of the biggest tests is if there's pieces that you can integrate into um, other platforms where people already are that make things very easy I would um, end up using those in conjunction with some type of um, built-in e-learning platform so a big reason that we have all of our videos over on YouTube is that they optimized for mobile well before that was really an option on our website and it has just made it so much easier for people to access so instead of always making them come to you for a particular platform make sure to get it out there on different places where people can find it where they already are mm, absolutely great um, and taking this down the kind of the logical extreme or one logical extreme uh, would be to think about kind of aspects of game design as part of your online learning. So this could be things like reward systems. So if people take, you know, five modules along this line, they get a, you know, virtual award for, you know, being really informed in this area. Or what we're looking at here is a uh, simulation that helps people walk through uh, what it's like to be in the courtroom uh, with the idea that it can obviously be really intimidating to show up and represent yourself in a courtroom to kind of get some sense as to what's likely to happen so it's less uh, it's less scary both to decide to do it and to then actually go through the process yeah I think the gamification realm is somewhere where we have a lot of innovation that is still to happen. I think we occasionally take mm -hmm. ourselves a little too seriously and we need to look at ways to get rid of the intimidation that is around the court system and give people a reward for learning about it because it's really going to help them if they're able to pick up some of the basic concepts and ideas before they're there. Absolutely. 
Yeah, let's just switch gears slightly in the realm of helping people to, um, to learn without necessarily your own staff time involved and talk a little bit about expert systems. Um, we've got a couple of different um, examples of expert systems, including a really kind of interesting, so this I, I think is a perfect example of uh, what we mean by kind of our definition of innovative is using the tools you've already got. Um, this is uh, Pine Tree, so uh, actually Kathleen was very involved, um, and I'll let her talk a little about it. But the idea of using Legal Law Help Interactive and Hot Docs to create just a simple expert system. Kathleen, you want to talk about what you did here? Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, I don't necessarily want to push hot docs for this purpose, I think there are, you know, there's more and more great software out there that's um, designed for this kind of logic tree sort of stuff. But we, uh, and we're experimenting with some of that now, but we have been able to use hot docs um, for s some successful projects beyond just uh, document assembly. And this is one example. This is a pretty popular um, uh, hot dogs piece of ours where we basically just worked out um, all the logic for determining if somebody would be eligible for food stamps or not. And then we incorporated that, that into uh, the logic into a hot dog module. We did a similar thing for uh, stateside legal with a um, kind of a uh, benefits checkup tool. Um, so Hot Docs is a pretty good um, tool for this kind of thing, among others. And then here's another, um, so as you get to more sophisticated expert systems and branching logic, um, neonatal, neonatal logic is um, uh, a kind of a leader in the legal aid um, space for this. And they had a, a competition at Georgetown Law, and they came up with a lot of really interesting possibilities for um, what one can do with a, an expert system. So this is, a, in fact, going back to kind of inf infrastructurally how to, in how to innovate, this idea of putting a specific problem statement in front of a group, in this case a group of law students, can be a really interesting way to just generate a lot of ideas. Logically, some of them really terrible, but some of them pretty good. Um, as so a, a another example, here in the, sorry, go ahead. Uh, there's a comment here in the chat um, which was in response to using uh, YouTube that um, one of the Florida programs uses Vimeo for the same reason. And I just also wanted to point out that with Vimeo, you have an extra ability to add um, a password in the accounts so that if you are creating content that you only want um, certain people to see, especially if it's around an issue where you're litigating and you don't want the other side to see some of your strategy CLE type stuff, um, then you can put that behind that password and then give that password out. It's a nice feature that uh, YouTube has not integrated at this point. Fantastic. Fantastic. And um, this is a kind of a last example in the realm of um, helping the clients learn for themselves. Uh, this is a uh, Dutch site um, that is, it has a big concentration in family law, though I think it is not only family law. Um, they've done a lot in regard to both expert system and kind of triage, including I think really interestingly, they've integrated with a online dispute resolution system, which is, so dispute resolution is uh, something that is really quite widely used in kind of the NGO realm, in kind of worldwide uh, peace movement. There are a number of online dispute resolution um, solutions that are already available. So the idea of uh, helping people not only understand their legal rights, but possibly even kind of getting around the need for any legal um, uh, process altogether by helping them in a place where you might be able to help someone, like potentially family law, uh, to work out an arrangement amongst themselves. 
Kathleen, I know you mentioned this is a site that you were really uh, kind of jazzed about. What, what seems exciting to you about, um, about what they're doing? Yeah, <clears throat> those of you who, who are at uh, TIG last January probably saw their um, demonstration. Uh, I just thought it was one of the most exciting things at TIG this year. And uh, we even looked at it for a, a TIG proposal this year in Maine, but um, <laughs> ironically, I think that they have developed something really uh, elegant, really clean, and I just, they've thought through kind of all of the steps and all of the uh, technological issues, and I, I think it's, it's really adaptable as is, and I would encourage other people to look at it, what held us back and may be true for you, but if it isn't, I would say you should go for it, um, is that we didn't think that our court system was ready um, to embrace this. Uh, but if you come from a state where you have a pretty progressive court system in the family law arena, um, I just think this is a, a fantastic model. Fantastic. Great. Brian, anything else to add? Or actually, while Brian's talking, this would be a great time to, if you have questions about any of it, we, we don't know tons about all of these, but we can do our best to answer questions either about these specific examples, or we'd love to hear your, uh, your thoughts as to either what this sparks for your own program or other kind of innovative ways potentially to provide resources without actual staff time behind them, so self-serve. Brian, what's your, any, any other thoughts in this whole area before we move on? Um, I, I guess there's one thing, just going back a little bit before that, um, when you were really talking about those uh, baseline technologies, um, I wanted to remind people that um, LSC um, revised a document known as the baselines, kind of what the basic tech that a, a legal services organization should have in place is. And I put a link to that report um, from 2015 here, and that is one of the things that we're going to focus on a lot more. Um, with regards to um, triage, one thing that's very interesting to me is the idea of uh, something I haven't seen done yet is giving clients more access to storing some of that information that they may give you through a triage tool um, to create kind of the equivalent of uh, what you would see in a health vault where you have all your health information stored securely. Um, if clients had access to that information that they could then pass on to an advocate or use several months later for document assembly or then use in a matter um, a few years after that, uh, I, I think that that could save a lot of time long term because there's a lot of duplication as they call source to source or uh, run into a legal matter a year or two later that they then have to go research all that old information. There's no real secure place where the client is in control and has the opportunity to keep that information from matter to matter. Fantastic. Uh, and we've got a comment in the chat, which is a really interesting one. Um, so a couple of different um, uh, vendors that provide automated SMS intake, so TextIt or Rapid Pro, um, allow you to build an intake system based on SMS, and presumably intake, or you could even do a, um, uh, so like, like we looked at in the first example, a, um, a branching structure to provide information without actually um, involving folks at all. Um, yeah, it'd be really interesting to potentially think about the, the overlap there into the legal aid. In fact, I was not aware of those two folks to look at it. Awesome. Um, fantastic. So let's talk a little uh, before, um, sorry, before I go to that case study that I was just going to. Um, let's talk just a little bit about the idea of making connections. So there, the idea now that beyond obviously self-serve information, there's the idea that we'd love to facilitate the passing of information in a, uh, a more, in a quicker way, good information in a quicker way to uh, be able to serve more people. 
um, live chat, not a very innovative solution in the, in the legal aid world anymore, but it is a, a pretty good bang for the buck people are, are finding. So the ability to uh, allow people who are browsing through online information to be able to uh, just chat uh, somebody on the other end. If you want to take kind of a chat and SMS uh, to another level, there's the idea of like somebody would with a live chat, instead doing that via SMS, so phone texting. Um, and this is something that there's been a reasonable amount of traction on in regard in the, the realm of hotline areas. So text for life, for instance, is a suicide hotline. Um, and they, about two years ago, they moved to support uh, requests for help via text uh, in the same way that you would call and say, I'm, you know, I'm thinking about hurting myself, can you help? Um, so, and they have found that they get dramatically more volume uh, via text than they do phone calls. And I know this can sound really alarming with the idea of providing legal information or uh, close to legal information via, you know, 140 character text message. But I would uh, counter that I'm not any easier to counsel people uh, and prevent suicide via text. So I think it's a really interesting area to explore. Kathleen, what are your thoughts in this particular realm? Yeah, just one really simple thing that I've been thinking of, which is not very ambitious really, but it seems obvious to me. I haven't convinced my executive director yet, but in the context of online intake and online triage, um, one of the things I think programs have struggled with and that uh, we're beginning to struggle with is um, being able to get back in con contact with people after they apply online. Um, and I know the rate of callbacks varies from program to program, but it's it's a lot of times a problem, and it seems to me that using texting for that, just to arrange the first, you know, face-to-face -face or telephone contact, uh, just makes total sense. Absolutely. Even if you are going to go into complex legal conversations through texting. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, and texting, um, you can do it in a number of different uh, online interfaces now, including just straightforwardly Google Voice. Um, so it, it doesn't necessarily mean that your, your um, uh, lawyers or other folks doing intake and, and calendaring need to actually be sitting there on their phone. Um, there's a lot of more straightforward ways than that. And also, you right, know, just also, for, sorry, for, for simple referrals and you know, the kind of uh, simple referral and advice sort of things that we do, it seems really uh, well suited to that also. Great. Brian, thoughts in this area? Yeah, I think you also really need to look at the target uh, demographic or population that you're working with. For um, younger clients, this is definitely a preferred method. Um, we have also had our veterans unit specifically um, have individuals who uh, run out of minutes on their cell phone, um, but they have something like uh, Google Voice where they get unlimited free um, text. And if, if it's a cost issue, um, this can be a cost savings way for individuals to communicate. Yep, absolutely. Great. Um, so here's another example of connecting. This is a really, it's a little, it's, it's a little unclear whether this is a triage, whether this is, it's, um, but a really interesting example out of the um, uh, direct services world. So this is a um, uh, organization in, based in Minneapolis called Bridge for Youth. Uh, it's a mobile app, so people download onto their phone, and it allows homeless youth to look in real time for where they can go for either food or for, uh, for shelter. Uh, so it's literally what is the availability right now of 
uh, of food and to me, where you can see at the top of it, an uh, obvious question that is not, was not top of mind for me is, is there a, a warrant for your arrest right now? Um, is going to be a obviously contributor to where you can show up to get food. And some places, in fact, do not and specifically do not care about that. Um, so this is a, an interesting example to potentially parlay into the world of legal aid to think about what can we give people in approximate real time, including things like uh, status, uh, so who to call with a particular problem, what hotline might be available, like for instance in a disaster, maybe there are a couple of different places who can help and you could have different timelines or different um, uh, hours for them. Things like that can be really interesting. Um, and got a comment uh, in regard to this particular case study, the Youth Service Network app. Uh, it sounds amazing. Working with those returning from incarceration, the biggest issue are that the services and resources are outdated dated or literally just not available. Absolutely. So it helps somebody understand exactly what's available just for them based on their particular status. Uh, another example here, this is another uh, something that really is not I don't think we think of as innovative in a, in a traditional sense. We're certainly not breaking any technology boundaries with the idea of a kiosk, but it can be something, it's just a different way of thinking about the, the information you're providing. You're reaching out in a different way to potentially a different audience than you are through a traditional uh, website or a traditional one-on-one. -on -one because you can put them at the spot when people really need the help. So you can put them in a courtroom or a library or at a community center. Um, so this is an example of um, uh, Montana Legal Aid's um, idea. Kathleen, any thoughts about kind of any of these so far in the realm of kind of helping to connect uh, legal aid organizations to potentially somewhat different audiences than they might otherwise? Laura, I'm drawing a blank. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. <laughs> it's a general question. Fantastic. So there's a, there's a good question here, which is, have any groups crowdfunded um, cost of kiosks, how are agencies paying for them? Uh, Northwest Justice Project um, actually got money um, through a federal uh, BTOP grant, a broadband uh, grant. Um, some of the communication-based uh, monies that go out um, specifically look at reaching out to vulnerable populations, providing resources uh, to them. Uh, we partnered with one of the local tribes also in Washington State to put that together. Finding creative sources of funding is definitely important on some of these things. I don't know of many um, crowdfunded projects that have worked in legal services. Part of it is a critical mass. We need to get more people from legal services on social media and on crowdfunding sites so that when we try to launch programs like this, um, they are able to get the salience in the community. I know that um, Stephanie Kimbrough um, tried to do some crowdfunding stuff around gamification about a year or two ago um, on trying to teach the basics of probate and estate uh, planning through a game. A great idea, but it, it didn't um, catch on in that area. I think it's because a lot of us don't have those communities already built. Um, you need yeah. the, the fans or the followers there to use crowdfunding effectively. I, I agree I with that, but it seems like a... Go for it, Kathleen. Oh, I think primarily, Brian, correct me if, I'm, if you think I'm wrong, that uh, most of the court-based ones have been funded by the court. Like there, in California. Some that have been funded by the courts. There's also... Uh, usually every year or two, there's some ABA and some uh, state court money that is available for innovation. Um, our Access to Justice Board has went after that for things like electronic filing, but a, a kiosk or outreach would definitely be in those areas, as long as you get a court as a partner in that funding proposal. Yeah. 
this would be another really interesting area to think about community collaboration. So if you think about legal services as only one of potential things that uh, you know, uh, people in need might want, then you could get a whole coalition of community organizations together and go after things like United Way money or um, community building type money. Um, which could be another really interesting um, source of funds. So anyway, um, we've also uh, had a one, comment about one more that. on the funding side. Although funding, I, I think we, it may be another uh, webinar topic that we need to do on its own at some point, uh, as especially since the budgets of legal services organizations tend to be pretty stretched. Um, City of Seattle um, has specific like digital digital literacy uh, money that. Um, works around uh, reaching out to vulnerable populations. Um, anybody who has like community computing centers, other things like that, uh, they traditionally have kind of went after the health and library groups, um, but they're very interested in partnering with legal groups. They just haven't really thought about that in the past. Absolutely. In the realm of um, kind of the idea of reaching out to folks that you might not otherwise connect with, um, there's always the, uh, the possibility of like the bus mobile model, um, where like for instance, NILAG has a, an, a literal bus um, that travels around the five boroughs in Long Island. Uh, there is actually a attorney on the bus, uh, but you could also, um, uh, staff this with the idea of a um, of somebody who's not necessarily an attorney, but is able to help make the connection. And then both the NILAG bus and I think most other models have a video connection. Um, so you can video in attorneys, pro bono volunteers, potentially even if the court is willing, a, a court system. Um, so to really make folks who are uh, otherwise have a, have a hard time um, getting help uh, to, um, to bring the help to them. And it, for those of you who aren't very familiar with the five boroughs of New York, you can actually be a long way away from um, much. Like on the end of Long Island, you're three hours out into ruralness. Um, um, so it is actually a, I mean, not compared to some states, but it is in fact fairly broad, widespread. And a last thought here. Um, so as we're thinking about connections, important not to forget about the connection with pro bono, pro bono attorneys. This is uh, an example from outside the legal aid world. This is a site that is geared to connecting uh, skilled technology volunteers with nonprofits. Um, in this particular realm, a realm I, I know all too well, um, there is a, there's a very similar problem to that in the legal aid world, which is that it's fairly straightforward to find skilled volunteers who are willing to put in a small amount of time to do a small chunk of work, uh, and it's hard to get organizations, and so in this case we're helping nonprofit organizations, to get them to, to have a chunk that is well enough defined that they are easily helped. Um, so this is a site that actually uses a very uh, specific template model for uh, the nonprofit to be able to say, I need help with exactly this. So I need help like, for instance, with search engine optimization. And there's an actual definition as to what that means. This is what you would need to provide in advance. This is what the skilled volunteer is going to help you with. Here's how many hours is expected on both part time. Here are the templates that are going to be used. Um, so in the realm of thinking about unbundling, this can be a kind of an interesting model to think about can, are there particular things that can be chunked out in such a way that they become less scary for a pro bono attorney to, to take on. Kathleen, any thoughts about this particular model? I love that idea. I, I would like to explore that. Um, but I, that's about all I have to say about it. <laughs> great. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I think this is a great concept, and I, I hope it works, and I'd like to try it. Oh, this is also an interesting area because there's um, a lot of 
um, excitement around how how do we come up with new things for um, pro bono attorneys? How can we really connect people with new different audiences? Um, there's a separate set of uh, grants that are available around those separate from the TING grants that are new. Um, I, I think that looking towards other communities, trying to find some of those best practices and importing them um, here is a great way to do that. Mm, great. Yeah, and this site has actually been around for a couple of years, and it's been full in attracting volunteers. Interestingly, they have the, the organization that runs it uh, doesn't have quite as many connections with the nonprofit world. So they have, in fact, a lot more volunteers than they have nonprofits. Uh, but they are gradually evening out that ratio with the idea that logically nonprofits are eager for, for skilled tech help. Um, but it really, technology, I think even more than the legal aid world, you have the you have problem that you have a lot of skilled technology volunteers who know many things, but not necessarily the technology space, or sorry, not join me, decided to disconnect me. I apologize for that. Um, fantastic. So let's move on to our next section, um, the idea of, ah, sorry, there is a question in the chat. I have a question about the community core. Their website says bring real world tech experts to encourage your clients to pursue a career in STEM. Um, what does this mean? How does it apply to legal services? Interesting. So that means, so one of the options uh, for a, uh, a, a tech, so basically as a nonprofit who is looking to bring on a uh, technology volunteer, one of the things that you can do is you could potentially bring in someone to speak to your group or to mentor kids or something like that uh, to encourage uh, folks like, for instance, your high school kids or things mm -hmm. like that to pursue education. So that would be the equivalent of asking, so, so connecting up pro bono lawyers to a after school group or a a uh, group of, you know, uh, folks you're doing job training for to talk about um, uh, going into the legal field is, would be the translation there. Yeah, there's, right. um, there's also a really interesting program um, that we've just started to talk to that's at a Boston University um, that takes uh, individuals who are interested in learning mobile web uh, development and app development, connecting them with nonprofit organizations, um, and a, a mentor in that field, and then creating resources for the nonprofit while they're learning how to use the technology. Hopefully, we'll have a webinar on that later this year. Uh, but any time that you can um, kind of harvest that volunteer uh, group that's interested in learning technology, it, it can definitely cut down the cost on developing this stuff. Yeah, <clears throat> more and more law schools, uh, as some of you know, are getting into uh, tech training for their law students, and uh, it, I think it's a re really fertile area for us. We've been doing some projects with uh, New law, law Lab at Northeastern, and uh, of course there's Kent and uh, Suffolk and Boston and a handful of others. I think it's a growing trend in law schools, and we should be... Absolutely. Fantastic. Um, so Jimmy mentions um, that my local law school, Florida Coastal, has a project on law and technology. Great. Fantastic. All right, let's talk a little bit about directly having conversations here. So starting with the idea, here's kind of the ultimate of a low-cost solution that could have a big impact. Um, is just the, the thought that there are a lot of folks now, or sorry, there, so like Google Translate, for instance, it now makes it free to translate things okay, like it's not a perfect translation, but to do a comprehensible translation from virtually any language to any language. So this has a lot of potential applications, including simply like someone shows up in the, at the office to be able to ask some simple questions like, are you hurt? I can now ask, are you hurt in Albanian, which I can guarantee you I couldn't have done previously. 
Um, and Kathleen, you had another um, uh, interesting application of translation in the creation of uh, website content. Right. Some of you have heard Gwen Daniels at Illinois Legal Aid talk about when they put up their uh, Spanish mirror site. And as you all know, they have a lot of content uh, to keep up with. And um, so what they, the protocol they adapted was to um, run their English content through um, Google Translate and then give the English version along with that Google Translate version to the translators. And it's been a while since I heard Gwen talk about this, but I think she said it saved them about 50% of the time they would have without the Google Translation at the beginning. But, and I, I suppose there are some translators out there who wouldn't like to operate that way, but she said that it saved that, their translators a lot of time. That's fantastic. Yeah, with the idea that it's certainly, no one's going to mistake it for a native speaker, the, uh, the translation, but it might well be at least comprehensible as a starting point. Yeah. Wait a minute. Caroline from Mass Legal just said she thought that they used something different than Google Translate or a different version than Google Translate. But anyway, um, and, and uh, I used they it. Used a, sorry, go ahead. And I use it sometimes, I don't use it for full text. Uh, we still use uh, community translators for that. But a lot of times if I just have a little bit of text or, you know, a phrase or some link language or something, um, I'll use Google Translate for that. Absolutely. Uh, and Carolyn is mentioning yeah. Like, like Illinois did, um, you need to get the Translate API, which is um, you can get for free, but you need to apply for it. Absolutely. Brian? Yeah. Um, there's also a great comment here from Jessica Frank over um, the A2J author um, course projects at law schools. They specifically look for legal aid clients um, to teach um, and work with as partners uh, for the projects that the students are putting together. Fantastic. Great. So more on um, uh, facilitating actual conversations. Uh, here's another not bleeding edge technology, but something that you can really uh, get a, a huge bang for the buck for, the idea of video conferencing. So if somebody is across the state, as opposed to making them come to your office or your lawyer go to them to have a conversation by a video conference, um, or uh, potentially to, um, uh, to, some courts are even now allowing in video conferencing, particularly from uh, specific locations. So you can, for instance, hardwire video con So there's really inexpensive versions, but obviously things like Google Hangouts or Skype. Um, there's also, um, you can create hardwired connections to potentially connect your office to a couple of courts around the state or things like that to make it easier for clients who can office easier than they can show up at court if the court allows that. Kathleen, I know you guys have a, a hardwired video conference system. Yeah, how are you? How are you finding yeah. that? Yeah, makes me think of Hugh again. Uh, Hugh Calkins. We bought a system when it was ridiculously expensive. I don't know how many years ago, but because we have a lot of offices across a very well, not by Western standards, but by New England standards, large state, um, it saved us a lot in transportation costs. Uh, for just even internal meetings. Um, and I, this was before any of the kind of uh, software we're using now was available. So I don't know that I would necessarily recommend the capital outlay for one of these systems now, but I do know that um, because of the opportunities we have to loan our equipment out to Lawyers for depositions, uh, Social Security office up in Presque Isle uses it for their remote hearings that I think we're making more money off of our system now than we than it costs us. Um, so that may be something to think about. Fantastic. 
um, and here's just an example of um, so even more than just a you know having a conversation between two adults this is an example of a um, uh, child uh, foster care a, um, actually having a um, uh, th these are official check-ins for the agency, although they are not right now currently uh, allowed to count towards their state, uh, that the state uh, defines a certain number of check-ins. The, uh, these video conferences, unfortunately, right now do not count as check-ins, but they do more than are mandated by the state, and they use them for this. So you can see, you know, you've got, you know, this five-year-old who is perfectly com comfortable with this technology to, to check in. Any other thoughts, Brian, thoughts on kind of just ways that folks are using technologies to facilitate actual human-to-human -human conversations? I mean, the, the cost of doing this type of technology has just plummeted so much. Um, for the last two years, the maybe even three, um, I did all of the supervising of an AmeriCorps VISTA who was located in uh, Montana to work with the LSMTAP program. Um, it's just so easy to have that rich communication at a very low cost at this point. 100%, uh, especially for internal. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, and in fact, for those of you who are looking around at different options, uh, we over at Idealware, we're also converting to be a remote office, and we've done a fairly rigorous look at a bunch of different and some kind of you know, in the field testing of a bunch of different options, and we've come back around to Skype as um, the, the most reliable and reasonable of a lot of five free versions right now. All right, so let's just, in our last section, talk a little about analytics and data, the idea of, uh, as lots of people are talking about these days, the idea of using data to provide better services or more services. So dashboards are a, this is another way to, uh, sometimes in very straightforward ways, like for instance using Excel dashboard, to pull together data from lots of different places to be able to kind of see at a glance and allow you to make more programmatic decisions um, for your organization. So a lot of people talking about dashboards these days. You've also got the idea of mapping. Um, so the ability to make visual information available. This is uh, outside the legal aid realm, maybe a, a familiar example to you guys. Um, the food desert um, uh, tool uh, provided by the USDA allows you to see in your own region where there's little access to supermarkets. So, and this is a, a planning tool that a lot of people are using now to say, all right, well, we need to make a concerted effort to bridge that gap. And so you can imagine as well, like, for instance, plotting the number of lawyers per capita or something like that for a particular, maybe by postal code, something like that. Really interesting looks at where there's virtually like no lawyers for miles and miles around. And if there are, I mean, you could even, you could do lawyers that accept uh, public interest cases or provide any discounted services at all. Um, which is then, it kind of helps you, it, it helps to make the case for um, potentially some of these innovative technologies that, um, that support more remote interactions. Ryan or Kathleen, any thoughts about either dashboards or maps? Yeah, I I really think of um, mapping is up there with uh, SMS. I, I just think it's something that's you know growing so fast and here to stay. Um, I can't say that we've used it for anything very innovative yet. Um, you know, I have used mapping based on um, census data to figure out what languages to do different uh, plan information in and on different topics, that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, it's just, it's everywhere now and it's not going to go away. I, I noticed just in reading about the Obama administration's new initiative this week on um, desegregating housing, you know, that that's all based 
a lot of that is going to be based on maps and all the new, uh, the online media outlets were showing maps of Chicago and where black neighborhoods were and you know it's just we all know it's everywhere and I think it's just so important that we need to pick up on it more than we have even though people like Gabe Hammond have been talking about it for the last 10 years <laughs> yeah I, I strongly agree there there's a lot going on in the private sector that we really haven't um, integrated in legal services we've got a um, webinar coming up that's going over Google Analytics that we'll have a little bit on dashboards, but our case management systems have so much information in them that could be cross-referenced with census data to put together real-time dashboards. The technology exists there in the private sector, um, and I look forward to it coming to legal services because I think we're going to find uh, big gaps in service areas, populations, groups that we could deal with. Uh, better in real time if we can see trends that are happening in cases and identify those earlier and then share best practices around how to deal with those cases. The, it's an exciting area that is just barely we're starting to move into in legal services. Absolutely. And there's a question in the chat. Are there data sources available as to where there are lawyers? Um, I don't know the answer to that. Brian, do you know? Are there, like for instance, are folks, uh, are ABA roles or the folks who have a law degree, uh, are those published? Most of ours um, keep statistics around that, whether it's in a format that you can easily import um, into some type of a dashboard or something like that. It usually has to be massaged some, uh, but that is information you can usually find, and there's usually a big geographic difference between where the lawyers are and where the populations that need help are. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, we've got another comment uh, yeah, my, the state bar, definitely. Yep, yep, that we've gotten a uh, list of attorneys from the state bar. Um, often with, Michael says, often with addresses that we can then map if we wanted to do so. Great, fantastic. Um, so this is basically what we've talked about. So the idea of uh, showing how great the need for legal aid uh, is and how your work is making a difference. Here's another example of this is um, uh, kind of the idea of going very big with big data. Um, this is an organization called Polaris, which does as a, a large multinational, international organization um, that runs a uh, anti-human trafficking hotline with just an enormous amount of volume. So they partnered with Google and Palantir. Palantir is uh, not as well known as Google, but is I, I think almost as large as, a, or at least in terms of market cap, is a very um, uh, profitable business, um, but they do specifically um, interfaces to help people large, large, large volumes of data. Um, and so they are, this is a visual, which I know is not very useful, but basically this type of thing is designed for uh, kind of a deep dive into um, particular questions. So like, a, you know, like an SPSS or a statistical mining tool, uh, not really designed to make pretty pictures that are easy to understand as much as for the experts to be able to, um, to see the trends and patterns. Um, they are using the uh, large volumes of data that they are getting from their hotline, which includes not only like what people actually say, but an analysis of background, noise, uh, whatever they can get off that line. There are obviously their location. Um, to, um, they're using it to mine, to find patterns and to actually uh, find particular, uh, you know, people and organizations that are engaged in large-scale human trafficking and to bring them down. So it's, uh, it's a realm in which, as Brian mentions, there's a lot of stuff that is possible on a large scale in the, um, uh, in the realm of having lots of data, this tends to require, this type of mining requires lots of data, like at the scale, at least statewide, if not nationwide, uh, to be able to see uh, kind of across trend. But this is the type of thing that if someone wanted to take on the idea of consolidating 
America across the nation. That sounds like a gigantic project. Um, but that there could be, I think, really interesting trends uh, seen in what kinds of services, patterns in what works and what doesn't in terms of getting folks to a good outcome, that type of thing. All right, um, and that is actually the end of our um, kind of uh, uh, rapid fire list of case studies and ideas. Um, Kathleen, actually, actually, before we um, go, go big, um, thoughts on this idea of just data mining and things you might be able to get at if you had a ro robust look or way to kind of troll trends in your own data? Boy, really put me on this spot there, Laura. <laughs> sorry. Um, ask, well, no, 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 no. I, 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 I think sorry. I, I think that um, you know we just a very simple uh, thing that comes to mind is that um, we have, and I think other rural states may have the same issue, have always. Um, being able to better serve uh, the areas right around our local offices, and we underserve um, the more remote, rural, more rural counties. Um, mm -hmm. Of our online triage and intake, um, I'm very curious to see if uh, we're going to be able to reach some of those more rural areas better. I think. There was some place in the Midwest who did see that with online intake and triage, and that um, is just a pretty obvious example of where we could, if we could map those changes and see that visually, that that would be be very helpful. Um, the other thing that comes to mind is I think Ed Marks in New Mexico is um, with their online triage is talking about mapping trends um, in terms of figuring out emerging case types, emerging issues. Um, mm. And I've heard Ed talk on that, and maybe some of the, uh, the rest of you had too. And I think keeping an eye on what happens in New Mexico with that is going to be interesting. Absolutely. Fantastic. And now let's toss it broadly. I'm going to toss it. I'm going to toss it to Brian in just a second. But to you guys out there first. Um, so obviously you have questions about any of this stuff. This is a great time to ask it. But also I'd love to um, uh, to hear from you of either what kind of this sparks for you, kind of maybe one idea that you're taking back for your organization or uh, it's one thing that you've heard of that sounds uh, pretty nifty or pretty interesting that, uh, that might be interesting for folks who are. Um, uh. So put one of those things into the chat, if you would. So either one thing that's sparking for you and one thing to take back, or one really interesting thing to add on. Brian, in general, as you think across all of the areas that we've covered, are there uh, innovative projects or uses of technology that come to mind that, that you'd like to see done more in the legal aid space? Um, the, uh, the dashboard and anything we can do along with our data um, is most interesting to me, followed by the what we can do to really empower clients to have some control over their information and provide for their legal welfare long term uh, whether that's teaching them through games or a client portal that connects to our triage portals i'm not sure what that is but i, I think we need to empower clients to have more agency in what's going on with their legal issues yeah yeah, and actually I'll say for me, and then I'll, I'll, I'll warn you, Kathleen, I'm going to throw it out to you. Just kind of thinking through and putting all of this stuff together, one thing that really stuck out to me, this isn't necessarily a, a trend, but just one thing that I hadn't really thought about before, is the idea of pulling in, so like for instance, the Dutch site that has online dispute uh, resolution, to think through what can be done if we assume that what we're doing is not just providing legal aid, but potentially reducing the number of people who actually need a lawyer. Um, so how can we 
how, how can we provide online tools that will ultimately get clients to their goals as opposed to just assuming that they are, not that we all are, um, but assuming that uh, they need a lawyer. I think was a really interesting thing that stood out to me. Kathleen, is there kind of just one thing that is, or multiple things that are kind of your just left as a, as a takeaway? Well, I, I, I'm really excited about how um, we're going to be, we are starting to and are going to be able to um, deliver more self-help tools, um, more appropriate referrals um, to clients through the triage without, and, and to reserve our in-office resources, one-on-one uh, -on -one resources for the more uh, complicated problems. Um, and I, I, I'm really excited about that because we're, we're just, kind of buried um, in, in phone intake and it's just not working for us. And I think that resonates with a lot of people. Um, so put, what do they say, you know, practicing at the top of your license, <laughs> so to speak, mm -hmm. um, and, and using the online health tools for um, the, the simpler things. I just wanted to mention also um, in response to what Brian was saying about uh, client portals, that um, a few of us are involved with the National Center for State Courts right now in designing um, an online client portal that will uh, be uh, court-based. There will be a, um, a, a pilot um, in some court in the country or some state court system in the country. Um, I, I'm, I think it's going to be um, a good model and something that I think uh, legal aid can learn from, and so I think it'll be uh, good to keep an eye on that and see how that how that works out, and to to utilize the model that comes out of that for maybe some legal aid projects. Absolutely. Um, and uh, a viewer number 56, who has been a, a very prolific chatter. Thank you so much. For, uh, so. For, for, person entering things into the chat, thanks so much for all your participation, uh, has, has put in, you, the youth service network is pretty amazing, but the problem or challenge or opportunity is that you need buy-in. You actually need housing organizations to care about updating other service providers and their capacity without worrying about their image. Uh, like for instance, the fact that they are literally over capacity and turning away clients. I 100% agree. And this, I, like all, projects in which you've got multiple um, organizations coming together, um, which is, I think, more and more of the stuff that's really worth doing uh, is going to involve more than just one organization. It, you, it requires people to really clearly think through what's in it for every piece of the of the system. So what is actually in this? Why, why would a housing organization care? Um, because it helps them achieve their mission is a reason, but probably is not sufficient because there's a lots of ways that they could be using their time and resources to uh, pursue their mission. So kind of thinking this through as, as much an operational and logistical challenge as we look to collaboration as much as, or well, honestly, probably considerably more than it is a technology challenge. Fantastic. Brian, let me turn it over to you for a, uh, possibly a closing thought on innovation and then turning to what's up next in terms of those NTAP webinars. So uh, very excited to have done this webinar. This was a brand new topic for us. Um, if you've got any feedback, especially um, particular things that you saw in here that you think might make a good webinar in and of themselves, um, please leave that feedback in the survey. The survey in the chat over on SurveyMonkey, um, a lot of these ideas like triage and online intake, um, we definitely do a webinar in every year that has a significant turnout. 
Uh, lots of these ideas, though, are new ones that we have never done a webinar on, and we'd be happy to go in deeper on any of those that are of interest to people. Um, thank you guys all so much for coming out, um, especially um, Laura and Kathleen. I really appreciate it. We've got some great trainings coming up. We've actually got nine more trainings coming up this year. Our next one is July 29th on Google Analytics and Google AdWords um, in partnership with uh, Atlanta Legal Services over their Olmstead Rights um, website that they just put together. Um, and then we have one in early August on expert systems um, tools that is a demo of an expert system that was put together. Uh, those are both new ones that have been added to our calendar that weren't there a few months ago. They've been added in the last 30 days.